Good morning. This is the backup video to the lecture for Monday, October what? 5th? 5th, 2020. This is, of course, period one. Uh, let's see. So, first off, we are going to ask you a question. Should history be painless? Should history be without stress? Should history be without trauma? Should I be teaching in such a way that makes people feel comfortable and happy inside? That's a straight question. Should history be comfy? And warm and fuzzy and nice and non-disturbing. Yes or no, and why? I will be rolling the dice unless somebody wants to volunteer. Miss? Um, I don't think that history should be comfortable because that's not how it happened. Indeed. And that would be taking that would be changing the events and how we interpret it, which creates so we're not learning exactly what happened. Absolutely. So if it was a yeah. peaceful event, it probably would not have been thought worthy of being in a history book. Mm -hmm. The newspapers of Utopia would be very dull. Yes, and then Jeff. I think in some ways history or events that happened in the past should uh, provoke you in some ways and make you angry and make you upset that things like that happened and so so you can learn from it and make sure that like Instead of just censoring things and not teaching things, we're learning from our mistakes in the past and we're growing as a society because of it. I hope so. Very close to my answer. Yes? Um, well, my answer was pretty close to that. Um, I was basically going to say, you can't really, you grow more from like pain and suffering and learning from that stuff instead of just, oh, here, there's a peaceful encounter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, think about the lessons that you've learned about your lives. <laughs> I know the ones I've learned, and I will call on you and you next, uh, have been incredibly painful. And that pain helps me to remember. It's not because I'm stupid. I mean, I may be, but what it is, is I'm a human being, and my nervous system is wired to take notice of those things that really get its attention. And trauma does that. So, yeah. It shouldn't be sugar-coated or... Like cushy or anything like that, but it shouldn't necessarily be purposefully the opposite, right? Why? Well, because, oh, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> but, like... No, I see your point. There's no point in engaging in what's what I call red pornography, which is, for example, the pornography of death. Uh, showing clips of people dying with no purpose other than to say, yeah, human beings can die. Uh, or, or going out of my way to be needlessly into the grime and gunk of it, needlessly. I agree with that. And I think that there are people who are teachers and, and other walks of life who talk about history who go that route for sensationalist purposes. Yeah, I see your, is that your point? Yes. Then I see it. Yes. I also agree with like there has to be a balance, but at the same time, if you take away the discomfort and the pain, it's kind of like stripping the humanity out of history. I read something in a uh, a novel over the weekend. Uh, I've I've been reading a series of modern urban fantasy books about a guy named Harry Dresden, who's a wizard in modern Chicago. Yeah, okay, I have no taste. Uh, but they're fun. And uh, in, in this book, there are a couple, every so often, like a good writer, he says something that really hits me. And he was talking, uh, what was going on in the battle was that the city was being attacked in a major way, like World War II style. And he talked about the things that he only partially remembered that he saw, the dead people that he was walking by in this battlefield that used to be a city. And he talked about his mind avoiding the pain, which is a natural thing to do. We tend to avoid pain and embrace pleasure. You know, we're wired to do that. Anyone who does the opposite has a little bit of trouble with their wiring. But then it occurred to him, no, he should remember these things. Because the pain is real. 
there are certain people for whom the words never forget, never again, have special meaning. Never again is what a lot of people who study and deal with the final solution to the Jewish question deal with. Never again. Never again should we allow a genocide to happen. Never again should we allow people to be treated the way the Nazis treated the Jews and everyone else that they didn't like. And even, even the people they did like, they, they were sort of harsh to. Never again. But we don't make never again real because we forget. Human beings forget. We forget what it costs to stop the communists in the Cold War. We forget what it costs to stop the Nazis in the Second World War or the Japanese imperialists. We forget what it costs to stop the Kaiser in the First World War, to stop the Confederacy in the Civil War. There is this cycle, in, particularly in modern history, you can see it, of people going through a hellish trauma like the Napoleonic Wars or World War I. And then there's peace for a while, because everyone understands, we don't want to go through that again. And then generation upon generation, the, the lessons fade into memory. It's just history. And <laughs> wouldn't you know it, the same sort of thing happens again. If you wonder why I tend to be a bit intense or obnoxious or insistent that we cover some of the more troubling things in life, and when you look at what... I do to connect those things in the past with those things in the present that I think are similar. Understand, it's not because I just want to inflict pain or engage in sensation. I am trying to illustrate to you something that had you lived through these events, you would have learned bone deep that most human suffering can be prevented. Most historical problems can be avoided. World War II, for example, is the most preventable war in all of human history, and it is thus far the worst war we've ever fought. If we understand history, and your lessons of history are going to be different from mine, your conclusions are going to be different from mine, but if you dwell upon the past, if you understand the sort of things that tend to happen when things really go wrong, you will do your job as a person in a free society and you will step up and stand for what you think is good against what you think is bad. And that's what makes freedom work. If people don't do that, freedom doesn't work. And we're no longer free. We end up getting ruled by people who say they work for us, but they really don't. So that's why. That's why this class is sometimes irritating or annoying. I'm irritating or annoying because that's the way I'm built. I found a job where that doesn't seem to be a problem. It's because I want you to understand pain as well as the achievements of history so that you can develop a sense of judgment. That's it as far as the opening, unless you have anything else to say. Okay, it's going to be nice to teach a full classroom of people, although this is still on the small side. I've got classes of 30 people. Uh, coming later in the day. That'll be interesting. Where we've been, I'm going to point at some spots on the map, and you as a class are going to say them out loud. What is this scene? Adriatic. Mediterranean. Tyranian. Tyranian. Ligurian. And what island is this? It's actually course. Okay. See, I knew I forgot something last week. It's not your fault. It's my fault. Okay. Down here, south of France, where Napoleon comes from, this is Corsica. That's the northernmost of the two islands over here to the west of Italy. South of that is where sardines come from. Sardinia. So Corsica and Sardinia. Corsica and Sardinia. Sicily is here, so uh, the football that Italy is about to kick. But this area is all part of the kingdom of. That. Okay, class. Kingdom of the. Two Sicilies. Thank you. And you're saying it with such verb. That's good. Two Sicilies. 
Uh, what's this? Yeah, okay. As a class, we're going to try this again. What's this? No! Yeah, here's the pain mistake. This is? Tuscany! Right. Okay. Genoa, where the salami comes from. See? Sort of along the coast, like the salami. What about this? Venetia, where Venice is. And you can think of Venetian lines. And this is Lombardy. Okay, good. Now, as I recall, we just did the Iberian Peninsula. So, in the center of Iberia is Castile. This is hardcore Spain. To the west of Spain is Portugal. Portugal. To the south, Granada. To the east, Aragon. Not Aragon, not Aragorn. And this is, think of the bulls, Navarre. Good. Ah, geography looks so fun. Okay, so let's go north of that. What's this? Ireland. Okay, so as a class, this is Ireland. Ireland, uh, Ireland is the westernmost of the British Isles. <laughs> this island is called Britain. 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 Okay, so we got Ireland, we got Britain, but Britain is split into well, here are two kingdoms, but it's really three. Up here in the north. Men wear kilts. Scotland. 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 Where the golf comes from, Presbyterianism. And my last name. I... <laughs> uh, this here is what country? Wales. England. Wales is over here. Wales is a little south to the west of England. So, England. And Wales, if you want to be, uh, want to be fancy. Okay, south of England across La Manche, or what we call the English Channel, is France. France. Good. Now, Holy Roman Empire! Like an exclamation. Holy Roman Empire. The Holy Roman Empire is, um, as you will learn, neither holy nor Roman nor an empire, but um, what Germans call it is the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation. Uh, it is what comes of Charlemagne's empire. It shifts eastward, and you end up with an emperor and the pope sort of duly controlling the heart of Europe. The Holy Roman Empire. And I didn't come up with the neither Holy nor Roman Empire. The philosopher Voltaire did. Down here, to the southeast of Europe, is a nation that sounds like they're all comfortable on the sofa. This is the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire. Um, and the Ottoman Empire is obviously Islamic, it's Turkish, and after 1453 its capital is Istanbul, or what used to be Constantinople. And it is going to be driving towards the heart of Europe throughout. Um, north of the Ottoman Empire and east of the Holy Roman Empire is Hungary. 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 And both sides are... Oh God, I'm sorry. I know, it's early. Both sides are going to be eager to consume Hungarian lands. Okay, both, the, and, and ultimately the Ottomans will, Ottomans will do so. Uh, over here is what will become Romania. It's Wallachia and Moldavia. But just know that it's Romania. And Count Dracula comes from here around this time. Uh, the real Count Dracula, Vlad Tepes, Taylor. Here is Poland, Lithuania. Poland slash Lithuania is, uh, on your maps, it's divided in two, but it's really one country, the Commonwealth. Uh, over here is Russia, very far to the east. And Denmark is this finger sticking north between the North Sea and the Baltic Sea. And north of Denmark is uh, Norway and Sweden, the rest of Scandinavia. So, um, you will be expected to know that on the quiz, uh, both of those maps. Now, where we've been is we have talked about the various qualities of the Renaissance. And we talked about it being a result of post plague prosperity, the rebirth of the ancient knowledge in a Christian context. We talked about the artistic emphasis and the emphasis on the individual. We talked about why it, is, it happens in North Italy and why... Uh, it also, to an extent, there is a renaissance of sorts in Spain that happens as a result of um, 
contact between what two civilizations? What two civilizations, when they rub them together, you get a rebirth of the ancient knowledge in a Christian context? Alex, you want to give it a try? No, take a guess. Okay. There are two religions involved. If you say the religions, that's something. The Muslims and the Christians, that's right. So we got Islamic civilization and Christian Christendom, which is Christian civilization. Which of the two is the more advanced? At this time. Uh, the Muslims. The Muslims are much more advanced than the Christians. So whenever the Christians get a hold of Muslim people or Muslim lands, the Christians bootstrap themselves up and they become more advanced. Um, this does not happen in the Byzantine or the old Byzantine area where the Ottomans are because you have the more advanced civilization conquering the more primitive one. There's not much cross-cultural contact there. But in Spain, where Castile is conquering Granada, oh, there's a lot of cross-cultural contact. Okay, now we are going to go through a list of key Renaissance figures uh, that are listed in your book or in your notes. And this is, this is probably the most formulaic bit of memorization I'm going to ask you to do. And the reason I'm asking you to do it is because, here's a hint, what you see on your note sheet is exactly what's going to be on the quiz, or almost exactly. So, John Wycliffe. John Wycliffe is an English thinker who is a critic of the church. He's a church reformer. And what Wycliffe wants to do is he wants to... Uh, Reform the church to be more Christian and less oriented towards the Pope's temporal power. Millie, where are you? What does Wycliffe get for his troubles? Burned at the stake. Now, why do you think the Church of Christ on earth is so willing to burn? A church reformer at the stake. Colton? Okay. What event happens in the late Middle Ages that's so horrible that it makes the church gun shy in terms of listening and tolerating any reformer? There's an event that happens, I'll give you a hint, in southern France that's so bad. It really makes the church resistant to thinking about anything or to tolerating anyone publicly criticizing them. Jesse? Is that you? Yeah. Anyone have an answer on that one? Yes? Was it the Albigensian Crusade? You rock. Yes, yes, yes. The Albigensian Crusade is so horrible that the church develops a flinch when it comes to any criticism. They don't want to hear it. And because they don't want to hear it, it gets driven underground. And it's going to become a problem. Casey? So, John Wycliffe is one of several church reformers. He's English, by the way. Uh, who is convicted of heresy and burned at the stake for criticizing Holy Mother Church. Eugene? Because Holy Mother Church is afraid that if you let things go, you're going to invite another Albigensian crusade. Forgive me, I'm not used to it. Speaking behind a mask, but since I'm handing your work out, I need to be behind it. Okay. Guinness Leonardo Bruni. Somebody want to tell me? It's in your notes right there. Who is Leonardo Bruni? Yes, please. Um, he was a humanist, and he was called the first modern historian. Yep. Bruni is the one who comes up with the three ages of history that we use. Now, this is a pretty gutsy thing to do. 
considering. Here's why it's got some. Okay, there's the ancient world, which ends with the fall of Western Roman Empire. Fine. That's different from what happens in the Middle Ages after the fall of Western Empire. But Bruni says, we are now at the beginning of modern times. He says that his generation is experiencing something so new, so unprecedented, that there's nothing that can compare to it in the medieval period, and therefore, it's got to be something totally new. Now, it's one thing to look back in time and say, yeah, things kind of changed at that moment. It's another thing to say, things are changing so much right now that it's a whole new age of history. But Bruni does so. Okay. Let's see. Lee, tell me about Mar uh, Marsilio Piccino. It was a philosopher of science. He was an astrologer, and he translated some works in Latin. Yep. And the translation of Plato is the key thing that you'd want to remember about him. The humanist, excuse me, the humanist philosopher thing, a lot of people have that. But he translates Plato, and Plato being one of the big Greek philosophers is kind of a big deal. Okay. So, Johannes Gutenberg. I get a volunteer on this? Yes. Uh, he develops a movable cut into a functional frame. And his first frame is the whole Right. Gutenberg changes the world. Not because he invents the idea of printing. Alyssa Woodward? Alyssa. China. Like so many things, uh, is the source of block printing. Tiana? Yep. Thank you. But what the Chinese do is they'll print a whole page uh, from a piece of wood. So what they do is they carve the wood by the page. And that will grant you massive uh, ability to print page by page. What Gutenberg does... And this is the printing equivalent of taking fireworks gunpowder and turning it into muskets. Gutenberg, first of all, doesn't use wood. He uses metal. Metal is finer, it lasts longer, and you can have smaller print. And Gutenberg does not print by the page. Gutenberg prints by the letter. So what you do is you get a bracket and on that bracket you lay out your print. It's going to be in reverse just because that's the way it works. Uh, but you lay out your text and you tighten up the brackets so you've got your page all set right there then. After that, you dab it with ink, and you dip it onto paper until the ink begins to fade, and then you dab it with more ink, and you dip it onto the paper, and so on and so forth. Oh, I don't know how you wear those things all day. I really don't. Um, Gutenberg with a good set of letters and numbers and punctuation marks and print anything. Any page, any book, anything. And what this means is you no longer need monks in scriptoria copying books down diligently by hand. 
In fact, the skill that it takes to make a beautiful illuminated manuscript largely dies because of Gutenberg and his press. Because you no longer need it. It's no longer competitive or efficient. People will get it as a luxury item, but luxury items are not going to support the industry that used to be there. But there's more than that. It's not just the, the hand copiers that are being put out of business. What's also being put out of business are the bards, the scouts, the minstrels, the troubadours. Because their talent is mnemonics. Mnemonics, M-N-E. Mnemonics. Right? I'm hooked on mnemonics. M-N-E-M-O-N-I-C-S. Mnemonics. Mnemonics is the study of memory and how you load memory. And I learned this in a book about Matteo Ricci, who's the great Jesuit missionary to the Ming court in China, in the Chinese Empire. In the year 1600, he becomes a courtier of the Ming emperor. Amazing accomplishment. We'll talk more about him later. And this, he learned the medieval ways of memory. And what he called it was a memory palace. You build a memory palace. I like museums, and I think museums are more common than palaces. So I'm going to picture my memory place as a museum. I learned something new, like the definition of mnemonics, and the name Matteo Ricci, a Jesuit missionary to the Ming court of China in 1600. Let's say I, I'm going to stick with Ricci. So I've got Matteo Ricci's portrait bust with that little bit of information. And I'm in front of this big museum that to me looks like the American Museum of Natural History on, West, on Central Park West in New York, because when I was a kid, that was my favorite museum. I lived close enough we were able to go there a lot. So um, I go up the front steps, and I'm in the main lobby that has a giant canoe, giant uh, Polynesian canoe. It's a beautiful, beautiful canoe. Okay, Matteo Ricci is not fiction. Matteo Ricci is not literature. Matteo Ricci is history. So I'm going to go to the left, which is sort of the nonfiction uh, scholastic wing of my memory. Now, history is on the second floor, so I go up the marble staircase, holding Matteo Ricci all the time. Okay, so I'm on the history level. Is it ancient history? No. Is it U.S. history? No. Is it art history? No. Uh, it is European history and Asian history. So I go into the European history wing. Is it modern era? Is it World War I, World War II? Is it 1800s? Is it uh, Napoleon and the French Revolution? No. It's early modern Europe. So I go to the early modern Europe suite of rooms uh, on the European history hallway of the history level of the nonfiction wing of my museum. In this suite of rooms, I can see things. And Matteo Ricci can go either in under the uh, Chinese history, uh, history of China interacting with Europe, or he can go into church history. I'm going to put him in church history. So I'm going to go into the church history room of the uh, early modern European suite. And there I see on the wall, I'm picturing this all in my mind, a portrait of Ignatius of Loyola, founder of the Jesuit order. Society of Jesus. And there's a little podium, a little pedestal right there. It looks like a little Greek column. And I place Matteo Ricci's portrait bust right under Ignatius of Loyola in that room. I memorize where he is, and then I leave. I, I picture myself leaving the um, church room of the early modern history wing, of the European history hallway, of the history level, of the uh, left wing or the uh, west wing. Uh, of my memory palace, I go out through the doors, past the giant dugout, the giant canoe, Polynesian canoe, and I'm back on Central Park West, where the um, sidewalk is made of little hexagons. Now, what's the point of doing all that? You're smart. You're better students than I was at your age. What is the point of doing all of that? What is the point of me visualizing Matteo Ricci as a physical object and placing him in an imaginary physical place like that museum. Anyone want to give a shot as to what benefit there is? Sienna. Yeah. 
I think it helps you keep a memory of him in your mind and um, place him in a category of what he did. That's it. But it's not just keeping the memory. Our minds are like sponges. If you could dig into your mind and file through everything, you'd be amazed at the stuff you remember. You remember things that your conscious mind hasn't thought about in decades. It's there, stuck in your memory. But it's finding the memories. You wouldn't believe how many times I say, I know that, but I can't recall it. I remember it, but I can't recall it. Recall is the key to making memory useful. And what having a memory palace does, and I don't do this, by the way. I've learned about this, but I learned it too late for this to be the natural way I remember things. It is a way for you to rifle through the files that are your memories and find with, 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 with reliability what you're looking for. The memory palace system works. And a lot of people who memorize things for a living use it. And it's not a bad idea for you to consider, which is why I'm spending so much time on it. That kind of memory is no longer necessary. And you can just look it up in a book. Gutenberg's press kills that over generations. It's like a dark age. It's no longer profitable. You can no longer make a living. And if people are not going to make a living at something, they're not going to necessarily work that hard at it. Not enough of them to keep it alive as a living skill. It's like going into a house that's over 80 years old. You go into a house that's over 80, 90 years old, you're going to see woodwork like you see in no house that's built today. Even, even mansions, because there are certain kinds of woodworking that used to be taken for granted in American homes that aren't done anymore by anyone. You can have people try to re retro reverse engineer and get something like it. But the actual skills of those carpenters to do that just in a normal house, like the woodwork that you see around the, the end, end of a room or the columns between the dining room and the living room, all that stuff is it's, it's died out. Because no one builds houses like that anymore. Instead, they use prefab wood and they use these methods and spray. It's just it's totally different. And the result is that it costs much less to build a house than it did 80 years ago. But the house that you get is not built the same way. It doesn't have the same craftsmanship. That's gone. Lost art. Memory palaces. They're an arcane art. It's like learning how to do magic. Prestidigitation. Uh, the kind of stage magic that um, Siegfried and Roy did. It's not something that most people are going to do. Gutenberg kills that. Now, why should that matter to us today? What do most of you carry around with you at all times? You're not allowed to use in school. A little magic box. A little magic box of knowledge. A little library of Alexandria. Our precious phones. Our precious phones, exactly. And there's a reason why I do not own a cell phone. Because they are seductive as heck. And it's so easy to just go through the looking, literally through the looking glass, into the into the artificial world. I used to. I used to do Facebook. Um, I still do YouTube videos, but I was much more active five years ago. And then I decided for me, I don't want any of this. And I never had a phone. I always do things on my desktop at home or laptop here at school. Without the need to remember things, because not only do we have access to books that are made of paper, now we have access to interactive uh, network computers. Is it necessary for people to remember anything anymore? There are people who argue that what we do here at school, not just history, but a lot of the things that we do are completely unnecessary to the modern world because all you have to do is look things up. To which I ask, if you're just looking things up, you're engaged in what used to be called in the China Navy, look-see pigeon. Um, what would happen is you'd have an American warship on a Chinese river, it was 100, 120 years ago, and they'd employ Chinese workers on the ship. So you get people from China who are learning how to operate a steam engine. But they're not taught the way Westerners are taught about steam and pressure and all that. They're taught in a way that's called look-see pigeon, which is, it's like a ritual. It's like magic. They're taught to operate the steam engine like there's a demon inside the steam and if you've ever seen live steam it's it's pretty scary if you 
don't remember things, if you don't make them your own, if you just rely upon the magic box, are they your memories, or are you just engaged in some kind of magic ritual, some kind of look-see pigeon? I know that the mind of humanity is being changed. It started in the era of television, radio. It's accelerating now that we have network computers at our disposal. It will probably conclude when somebody decides it's a good idea to install wetware in human beings. You know what wetware is. Wetware is electronics designed to interact with the human nervous system directly. So you basically plug in things, implants, into people like the pet implants that you get uh, on a pet that you get from the shelter. They have a chip in them, so you can find them anywhere. Well, there are places on Earth where people are chipped. Um, what if instead of just a chip that locates you, you have, you, you have the ability to, look, to, to download other chips, to install other chips, so that instead of having to look something up on the Internet, you can just rifle through the Internet as if it was your memory. I don't know how this is going to end. I know that Gutenberg changes the human mind more than anything since we developed writing. And writing is the biggest thing since we developed speech. So we've got some pretty big things in this history of communication. We've got the development of verbal language. We've got the development of written writing. We've got the development of printed books. And now we are in the fourth era, the development of uh, somehow connecting human minds to networked computers. And don't know. Don't know where it's going to end. Uh, it could be really cool, like the Matrix. Oh, you never, you've never ridden a motorcycle, but you, you're renting a motorcycle and you want to ride like a bad bob. So you oh, download your motorcycle program and suddenly you're riding like you're an expert. Maybe it's, it'll be fun like that. Maybe not. You don't know? It's lagging. Load. Yep. Yeah. Oh, maybe you want to do direct attacks on people. So instead of you know yelling at them or you know physically attacking them, <laughs> no. I mean we don't know. Okay. Uh, now Paolo Uccello is an artist who helps develop uh, three dimensional perspective. And I'm going to just go through that. Who's the other artist? Is it Masaccio who also, along with him, develops three dimensional perspective in art? Yes. I yes. hope yes. that's true, Sam. Okay, how does three-dimensional perspective in art work? Well, let's imagine that this is a canvas. For those of you at home, I'm drawing a rectangle on the board. Now, if you look at Egyptian hieroglyphic art and medieval art, they share something in common. They're sort of flat. So in ancient Egypt, you've got the classic walk like an Egyptian, you know, poses, uh, and, and they sort of move along the sides of the walls. In medieval art, you again have this sort of flatness. Think about if you remember seeing the Bayou Tapestry last year. This is the tapestry about the Norman conquest of England, and it looked like cartoons. How do you therefore create a three-dimensional perspective? Well, let's imagine a focal point. And you can do this with two focal points, by the way, also. A lot of artists do, but I'm just going to use one. So there you've got a focal point. Here, I'll make it easier to see for those of you who are far away. So what is the use of a focal point? Well, in the painting or in the drawing, everything references that focal point. So let's say I'm drawing a city street. Here's one set of buildings, and there's a door, there's a window, there's another, win another window, you can see how everything is sort of converging at that point. You got windows up here. And over here, it's bad for them. You've got the other side of the square. 
And you got more doors and windows and so forth. By having a focal point like that, what you are able to do is place objects in three-dimensional space. And by placing objects in three-dimensional space, those of you who see in three dimensions, which I think is everyone in this room except for me, uh, is going to appreciate that this is more interesting than a simple representation of a bas-relief, a bunch of flattened figures in a two-dimensional environment. Let me tell you about the first time I ever saw a three-dimensional. I can see it now whenever I play certain video games, first-person shooters, which are designed to simulate three-dimensional view. I don't have three-dimensional because I don't see out of my left eye. Did I tell you this story? I mean, I don't know. But I'm going to tell it again because uh, I'm old. And old people do that. When I was home from my freshman year of college, in freshman and sophomore year, I was going to meet some friends, and we lived about 20 minutes north of New Haven, Connecticut. And one of the things that my friends from high school and I did in upper class years is we went down to the Yale campus and hung out there because it was kind of interesting. They had some really neat uh, bookstores and... Uh, they had some neat restaurants, and just it was it was fun to be on the campus. They sent we could. So I got to New Haven about two hours before we were supposed to get, to get together. And I decided what I was going to do at that time was I was going to go visit the Yale Art Museum. The Yale Art Museum is in the center of the neighborhood where we used to hang out. And it's this horrible, brutalist structure. Brutalism, as you'll learn later in the years, this late 20th century, mid to late 20th century uh, idea of creating buildings that are just brutal, ugly, harsh, because they create an impression. And Yale bought an architect who sold them on a brutalist idea. The, side, the outer walls of this building are such a harsh rough concrete that people have literally been killed up against the walls by being thrown against the walls head first. I'm not joking. You put your hand up against and actually lean onto the wall, it'll come away bloody in many places. That's how rough the concrete is. It's like every little, it's, it's rocky concrete. So it's designed this way. It's intentionally brutalist. So I went in to the Yale Art Museum, paid the, you know, the voluntary fine fee. And I was going to look at the art. And it's like a maze inside. And they do beautiful things with darkness and light. It may be a hideous building outside, but it's a really interesting building inside. And I go around a corner, and there's this ramp, and there are these interesting lights and windows. And I'm walking by a painting, and it's uh, it's uh, the, the billiard room by, by Van Gogh. And I almost fall down. I almost fall down because of what I saw in the painting. It's the painting of a pool table in a cafe. And as I looked at it and moved, the back of the painting moved at a different rate than the front of the painting. What Van Gogh had achieved is something that you'll never see in one of the prints of that painting. You'll never see in a, an image of the painting, and I'll, I'll show you one later in the year. You'll never see it except with the painting itself, the actual painting. Because what he managed to do is create depth, a sense of three-dimensional depth in that painting. So I looked into three-dimensional space on canvas. I'd never seen anything like that before. And I spent the next better part of an hour just studying it, looking at it, and I still don't know really how he did it. It's miraculous to me. I'd never seen into something before. Closest I'd ever come before that is looking into a night sky from the deep countryside. You can see deep into the heavens. But I had never seen depth before like that. So... Cho and Masaccio and the others who helped develop the sense of linear perspective set the stage for what later Van Gogh is going to do and other painters are going to do 
to create, out of a two-dimensional plane, a three-dimensional space. Any questions or thoughts thus far? Okay, Balbasare Castiglione. Uh, Ms. Kenner, tell us about him. Um, was an Italian courtier, diplomat, soldier, um, a Renaissance and a Renaissance author who most famously wrote the book of the courtier. And as a mnemonic, Castiglione courtier, book of the courtier. And the book of the courtier is sort of like a how to win friends and influence people for the 1400s in Italy. Uh, it's what you should aspire to be if you want to be among the upper crust, among the cognoscenti, among the people who are in the room where it happens, to quote Hamilton. So, the book of the courtier. Vittorino da Feltre. Vittorino da Feltre. Mr. Um, Colton, sentence. He's an Italian pianist and teacher who set up a school at Mantua where he taught uh, Marquise's children together with many poor children and treated them all equal. He taught humanistic subjects but emphasized religion physically. Mm -hmm. The school at Mantua is what you want to remember for Duffeltry. Before I became a teacher, I worked in the field of mental health and mental retardation. I ran a residential program that moved people out of a state institution in Maine into community group homes. I actually helped set it. I set up the program, helped set it up, and I ran it. And it was part of a social service agency that had been built around a school named Woodford's, which for a neighborhood in Portland, Maine. And this school was kindergarten and preschool where children who had developmental disabilities and children who didn't, together. They played together. They were treated as, as the same as, as they could be because the parents who sent their kids there believed in the idea that people who have developmental disabilities, what used to be called mental retardation, uh, were people and that it would be good to get um, first-hand experience for their children, seeing them as people, not seeing them as, as something alien, something other. Uh, I always thought that that was interesting. I also always thought that it was very gutsy of the parents of the non-developmentally disabled children to send them to a place like that, because that seems to go against the normal parental impulse to protect their child at all costs. These parents seem to understand that raising children isn't just about protecting them from life, it's about teaching them some of the interesting, harsh lessons of life and allowing them to make friends with people who maybe weren't normal. Um, I think it was a gutsy choice. Well, the Feltry does that after a fashion by having the children of uh, the noble family that runs Mantua going to school with and being treated like classmates of people who are the sons and daughters, or sons, I think it's just sons, of craftsmen, uh, of, of bankers, uh, of lawyers, of artists, of doctors, and maybe even of skilled laborers. That's an amazingly democratic notion of education that the Feltry does. Now, Lorenzo il Magnifico de Medici. Anyone want to take a shot at him? Lorenzo, yes, sir, Jack. Italian statesman and ruler of the Florentine Republic during the high point of early Italian Renaissance. His death marked the end of the Golden Age of Florence. Fragile peace he helped maintain between the various Italian states collapsed with his death. Yeah. Um, the Medici were one of the families vying for supremacy in Florence. Machiavelli actually had connections to the other family that ended up taking over after the fall of Lorenzo. When we work, uh, look at some of Michelangelo's works later this week, you're going to see what Lorenzo il Magnifico looked like. Lorenzo the Magnificent de' Medici was considered the ultimate ruler slash patron of the arts. An enlightened Renaissance man, an artist himself, he was also a practical political leader. The man I compare him to the most is Marcus Aurelius. 
not because Aurelius was an artist, but because Marcus Aurelius was not just a ruler, he was also a first-class philosopher. Lorenzo de' Medici was not just the ruler of the city-state, he also genuinely understood art, he understood aesthetics, he understood beauty, and he understood how to get the best out of artists. When I was your age, I knew a guy who was a comic artist. He never really made it huge, but he made a career of, uh, out of being a comic artist, which is, which is an accomplishment. And uh, since uh, he played Dungeons and Dragons with us, larger group, he had a college professor from Wesleyan playing with us at one time, um, he would uh, volunteer to draw character pictures for money. Um, and the first time I had him do one, I, I, I micromanaged it, and it came out very mediocre. And I asked him what went wrong, and he said, you really just got to give me the idea and let me go with it. If you give me the idea and let me go with it, I'll do something interesting. I've never forgotten that. To this day, when I supervise someone, my goal is to tell them to do something wonderful along these lines and then let them do it. Um, it takes a certain confidence not to micromanage people. And Lorenzo got the best out of Michelangelo and other artists. He didn't micromanage. So that's where we'll leave things today. I understand that this is sort of a mechanical way of doing things. This is not my normal way of teaching. My normal way is more just lecture. But with the vast plethora of Italian names that I expect you to remember, this seems reasonable to me. Any questions, comments, or thoughts? Okay. Then um, those of you at home, you can start looking at those pictures that I put up there. We're going to look at them again uh, more closely, probably starting tomorrow. I'll be signing off in a moment. You can talk quietly among yourselves until this lesson. Mm-hmm.